Okay, uh, so without further ado, uh, we'll start today with uh, uh, continuing a lecture on the topic of uh, probabilistic computation, which we'll hopefully we'll be able to finish now. Uh, unfortunately, the slides are in Jupyter. Uh, no, no, no slides. There will be the Jupyter notebook, but hopefully everybody will be able to get along what's going on. Uh, so. We generally know the idea of data analytics. We know the Bayesian main Bayesian concepts. Last lecture, we focused on generally how to compute using those models. And we started with uh, some simple approximations. Uh, then we discussed uh, Monte Carlo methods. The problem with Monte Carlo methods is that we need to be able to reliably sample from the probability distribution in order to compute expectations, so generally do any kind of inference. And this is again a practical problem, this is not a uh, aspects of theory, this is how to get to the, uh, how to be able to compute some kind of inference in the, Okay. So, uh, to continue, the, uh, what we so generally the problem is that Monte Carlo methods are well defined and we can estimate uh, expectations of functions of parameters. So those functions can, for example, be those parameters directly, also kind of statistics of them, <coughs> uh, or Even more or less. So, uh, but probability some, uh, uh, sampling from distributions is well defined for the uh, one dimensional case when we just need to inverse the cumula uh, uh, cumulative distributed function, so we get the so called quantile function. So, we can generate a random number from a 0 1 interval and transform it into samples from the uh, probability distribution. However, this uh, doesn't scale up to the multidimensional case, especially that, as we've discussed in multidimensional case, there is a problem of so-called exploration of typical set. Because uh, in order to compute expectation, we need to get uh, uh, compute certain integral. This integral is uh, complicated because generally all probability distribution integrals are uh, scaled to, uh, uh, integrated to one and uh, they have very complicated geometry where most of the probability lies. There's a, the typical set is a, a set where lies most of the probability connected to the distribution. Typical set cannot be analytically derived uh, and needs to be found. So, if you are able to generate samples from probability distribution, you are generating samples from the typical set, and uh, that allows you to compute those expectations. Unfortunately, in a multi dimensional case, we have the problem of how to do it. So, there's a lot of graphical stuff, so, some packages, there's some utility functions. Those, this code will be available to you eventually, hopefully soon, because it's used for generation of uh, measures. So, generally, we will focus on the main tool of probability computation, that is, which is Markov chain uh, Monte Carlo. Because the idea of Monte Carlo generates samples, and the idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo is find a way to generate samples that come from the typical set. And because of that, we need to find that typical set and then get samples from it. The idea is that Markov chain is a generally a probability pro uh, process that randomly jumps from one point to another. So you can uh, assign it logically with, for example, the uh, dynamical system. So it's a dynamical system that moves from one point to another and this movement relies on so-called probabil uh, probability of transition. So, there's a distribution that, with certain probability, moves from one point to another, uh, and that movement allows you to... Uh, that movement allows you to... So, let's start with a simple example to uh, cover this. We have the... Uh, generally, the idea is to move from point Q0 to point Q1. So movement 
in this case will be a conditional probability of moving, co condition that we are located in point Q0, we want to move, to, uh, what's the probability of movement to point Q1, which of course relies on the movement, in, if in, a, in the two-dimensional case, relies on a movement from in one axis and another axis. So the probability can be decomposed, for example, as a normal distribution with certain standard deviation. Now what is the probability, the next point? So, in general point, we have an initial point Q1, uh, Q0, uh, matter of ind uh, indices. Lower index is iteration, upper index is the number of uh, the, co uh, the coordinate in the, uh, in the vector. So, we have this, can I hide it in some kind of way? Not. Can you hide the toolbar? Yes, tablet toolbar. Okay, it will be better like this. So, generally, because movement from point Q0 is a normal distribution, we have in gray possible points that we can move into the, uh, from the point Q0, the blue one. Of course, this is example 50, 50 sums. G generally, this is entire space, but there are in any kind of computer process, we have discrete points. So we have some number of points that we uh, want to transfer to, and such transition is, of course, movement from one point to another. So, starting from this point, we have this <coughs> series of candidates that are centered in this point, and then we move to the next one. So, of course, these changes are changes for us. The new candidates, those new ca then we have new points that we can move into, right? So then we can perform another movement again here to move to the next point. Okay? So generally that's the idea of the Markov chain transitions. We start from one point and move to another and another with certain probability. So we randomly walk around the space with some certain distribution. So of course we get some, let's say, related to each other samples, but, uh, points, but they are random. So this is a way of generating random numbers, in a way. We use the simple randomness movement, which can be generated rather easily, and we can move uh, to the next point. So this is the basis for what we, uh, we want to do, and generally Markov chain is an iteration of Markov transitions. So starting from one point, we move to the next, and next, and next, and next, and next, and next, okay? So we have a sequence of points uh, in our space that we're interested in, which we call Markov chain. And this, the entire point of what we want to hear is so-called stationary distribution. Because general stationary distribution is a distribution that if we average out certain points using the distribution, we get this distribution back. Or in practical point, if we have a reasonably behaved run, uh, Markov chain, then uh, it has a unique stationary distribution. We will not be covering the theory when it happens. In all cases that we will be discussing, it happens. And then this transition, uh, this distribution, is, uh, or the typical set of this distribution, is the set where the points of this Markov chain will be walking around. So if we are able to construct the Markov, a Markov chain with a desired distribution that we want, so this is called the stationary distribution or invariant distribution, uh, then points from the Markov chain will come from that distribution. And this is generally what we want. We'll, if we are able to construct that, then we are home. And the general point is that Markov chain not only explores that, explores that distribution, but generally converges to it. So, starting from some points. Here, we go to the, mark, uh, the typical set and we wander around it. Remember, typical set is a, as I said, it cannot be analytically derived. It is the 
point that is located somewhere away from the maximum of the distribution, which contains most all of the probability, and it's like, like a fuzzy surface that you cannot fully, fully define. So samples from the Markov chain will reach the typical set if it's a, it's a unique invariant distribution and will walk around it. And what, uh, such exploration is generally the main point of what we are doing here, that our uh, points will be wandering around it, so we'll be generating samples from the typical set. Getting samples from the typical set gives us the information about what is going... Uh, uh, so we'll be able to get the... using the uh, samples from the typical set, we'll be able to get information about expectation of functions that we are interested in. And that leads us to the uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo estimators. Last lecture, we discussed Monte Carlo estimators. We generally said that if we are generating samples uh, from the uh, distribution, the average of function values of points from the distribution tends to the, asymptotically tends to the uh, uh, actual expectation, analytical expectation. And the same happens with the Markov chain Monte Carlo estimators as long as we have the uh, our stationary distribution is a distribution that we want to compute expectation with respect to and uh, as long as this Markov chain covers certain aspects which are uh, being recurrent or in other ways uh, are ir irreducible and aperiodic, which is give us this consistency that in the limit we will get the uh, expectation. Which of course is very nice, but of course we won't be doing things in the limit. We will be doing things in finite samples because we can only compute finite samples of behavior. So, how does it look like? Well, generally it looks like this. Our, in the ideal case, our Markov chain will be reaching our typical set. Then, estimator of the expectation, this, is the, uh, this plot is the error of the expectation, uh, absolute error. So it will be dropping, okay? In the ideal case, we are approaching typical set, then we can get the average, this average will be approaching our distribution. Oh, yeah. The more we go, the closer we get to the points we want. So we have so-called initial mixing. This is mixing is the concept in Markov chain that it covers the distribution. So approaching, I think that the colors here are not really visible. No, they are. Uh, maybe I'll turn off the lights. So oh, okay. Uh, So the points covering the typical set will, gener will get us to estimate of the value that we want. Remember the, val the expectation, again this is something that was in the last lecture, the expectation is not only just the, the expectation of probability distribution, but it, it's going to be used as a histogram, as the uh, probability density estimate, probability estimate, all depends on what kind of function we want to compute the expectation of. The more we move, we move around the typical set, the more refined our estimate becomes. So, thin sample behavior approaches the, uh, the uh, actual value, which is then being asymp asymptotically converges to the actual value, all depends on the time we give the Markov chain to explore. Unfortunately, that was the ideal case. Non-ideal cases are more complicated and we are having issues with typical sets where the geometry of, uh, of it is more complicated. And this happens because Unfortunately, it relates on data, it relates on complicated relationships on data, on the bounds on the data, on transformations. So we can get something that is called, being called a pinch or a funnel. So generally a situation when uh, things become complicated. Those 
Such geometrical structures are generally difficult. For example, if you remember something about optimization methods, there was something called Kuntaka uh, optimal conditions, which was a method of determining when the optimum of the function relies on the boundary. And there was a situation that there was a requirement of linear independence of the gradients of the, uh, of the uh, bounds at those points. So, generally, in this case, we have the uh, such situation that where this is problems with differentiability of this typical set. And this is, again, this is an, let's say, uh, how to say it in, uh, in English, this is not an example of real typical set. This is a two-dimensional, let's say, explanation of how it works. Typical sets actually become complicated in multi-dimensional spaces. In 2D, everything is relatively simple still. In multiple dimensions, those, surface, those sets will be some kind of curve in the hyperspace that cannot be really uh, quantified, and in case of two-dimensional cases, those typical sets are still very similar to the ball around the maximum of the distribution. Uh, however, the higher dimensionality, the more complicated it becomes. And uh, so we have an issue that there are points in the geometry that become difficult when analyzing them. And the problem is that initial exploration can, of course, be okay because starting with certain points, we can get the Mark our Markov chains to explore. We've reached the typical set. We start to wander around it. And the samples from the, uh, from the Markov chain are generally behaving kind of okay. Nothing strange happens. Unfortunately, similarly to the case when uh, for example, in optimization, your gradient search was getting stuck in high curvature regions. You remember the banana valley function, for example. This is an example of a function that is very hard to optimize with simple gradient methods. This is a similar situation that we are getting stuck in those points. In those points, we get the, uh, we get the, the issue of being stuck. So our Markov chain becomes stuck and the samples are being generated very close to each other. And that, of course, makes big problems when estimating the expectations. Because initially, of course, the error will be dropping, but then after some times, you can associate it with, for example, with uh, PID controller, which has the uh, bounds on the control, that you have this so-called wind-up phenomena, that uh, you've reached the desired value, but it's still too much uh, saturated uh, integration on your uh, PID control, so it still generates the, uh, the control signal uh, and it moves you away here. So we are here accumulating knowledge about the expectation in points that we don't want to. We're just getting the points in the same, same space. And after some time, it is possible to ex escape that and wander away. And it will improve, but unfortunately, it still will be biased. And when we start to be exploring around the typical set again, we will still have a risk of getting stuck in the in this funnel, in this pinch, and get it. So this is a problematic situation, which we will be trying to cover how to combat that in certain cases, because this happens a lot. This is not a theoretical idea. This is something that really happens in more complicated models. We'll see in a moment a bit, a bit more complicated uh, model, which has global and local effects, and in that case, uh, the funnel happens, and those samples are generated. Because here is a, is, a, is a figure. I just plot a Bezier curve and put points from that. But you'll see in a moment that the code will also have the issues with that. And again, like when we move away from that, from our Markov chain, we'll wander, wander away. So, Assume that we don't have those problems, what we can say about the uh, behavior of uh, Markov chain? And fortunately, again, we have a situation that we can use the, the central limit theorem. If you remember central limit theorem, it's like that the sum of ra identically, random, uh, uh, ra uh, identically distributed random variables tends to be, has to be normally distributed. So, in this case, 
we have normal distribution with a mean at expectation, but the error is not lo no longer a Markov chain standard error. Uh, uh, Monte Carlo standard error is the Markov chain Monte Carlo standard error. In Markov chain standard error, here we had the number of samples. Unfortunately, in Markov chains, the, no, the all, not all samples are created equal because they are not completely random and completely independent from each other. In the case of Monte Carlo method, we assume that all our samples are independent. In Markov chains, they are not independent. They rely on previous sample because this is how are they, they are generated. So, in this case, we are not having the number of uh, the, sam the number of samples. We have something called effective sample size. And effective sample size is generally idea to evaluate how the Markov chain is autocorrelated with each other. So how next samples rely on the previous samples. This is the autocorrelation. And the main idea of the effective sample size is that it has the uh, it is usually lower than number of samples because there's generally it relies on the idea that we can estimate the autocorrelations of multiple levels of the of all infinite levels where it happens but practically of course it will be estimate of the finite autocorrelations so we are seeing how this sample is autocorrelated to the previous ones and that gives us the estimate of how the uh, estimate or our uh, effective sample size of us, or we can get some kind of estimate, which we'll be able to use then to quantify our errors and to observe how our, sum, our Markov chains are behaving. Because effective sample size is an important metric because it gives us certain intuition about how Markov chain is behaving. Of course, if all samples are uh, independent, then this part is equal to zero, right? Because, uh, and this is because this, so effective sample size is equal to n. So this is perfect situation. We have the uh, uh, complete. In practical cases, we have positive autocorrelations of some kind. So the and uh, the expected sample size will be less than n. And it can be significantly less than n. So like uh, half, 50% uh, or 10% is even not that bad, really, to get the sam samples. Depending, of course, our Markov, uh, uh, standard, uh, Markov chain standard errors will get bigger, but still it is not a terrible situation about our sampling situation. We can also have a situation that we have some negative autocorrelations because autocorrelation can be negative. So potentially we can get uh, effective sample size. We can get effective sample size of uh, which will be greater than n. But this is not something that we can actually practically use because it really depends on the realization, on the initial point, on the seed of random number generators. This is not a structurally uh, happening phenomenon that certain Markov chains are always negatively correlated. No, they are not. The, uh, but for certain starting points and certain seed realizations, of, then we can get chains that will be negatively uh, autocorrelated, so then potentially we get even smaller errors of our Mark, uh, uh, Markov chains. So this is the uh, general idea. ESS is an important factor because if ESS is really, really small, this usually indicates issues in our computation. If it's really big, then if it's really, really big, then something weird might be happening. If it's close to n, we can be only happy in those cases, but because uh, it gives us but in practicality, all kind of random numbers uh, uh, series will get some kind of positive autocorrelation, especially that random number generators are also periodic in some way. So we get the 
estimated central limit theorem uh, which relies on estimated standard error. So we estimate the variance using some kind of variance estimator like in Monte Carlo standard error and we use the estimator of uh, effective sample size. So this is a statistic that we'll be having when analyzing models in using Markov chain. And now there is an issue of how to distinguish when we moved away from this reaching of typical set and we are starting to move around it. Because obviously the reaching of typical set will not be uh, will not contribute positively to our estimates. Mm -hmm. Those samples are strongly upgraded and are still not in the typical set, so they will just move us away from our estimate. So we want to know when our samples are already in the typical set and we can sample them freely without issues. So there are few ideas. There are certain theoretical results that rely on, and after initializing the, uh, uh, the Markov chain, we can determine when this initialization ends, and this is very dependent on the probability distribution, requires you a theoretical work on each individual case. This is practically not done. Uh, there is option of adaptive uh, schemes that are relying on that we are observing how the chain behaves and knowing from that how it behaves, then we can get some kind of information on when it's approaching the stationarity, but there are not really effective implementations that are working now. So there are some, some, uh, some ones, but nobody implements it practically because the general idea how we're doing in practice is heuristics. And heuristics are usually drop fixed number of samples. In the case of STAM, the, this idea is called warm up. There was, it was originally called burn in, that we had to burn some samples away to get to the right, uh, right point. Now it's called warm up, so like our Markov chains are warming up to, to the world. So in STAM, 1000 samples is being dropped, 1000 samples is being used as Markov chain samples for our estimation. This is the, our defaults. You can change those defaults, you can increase numbers of samples, but, uh, and uh, increase warm ups, but it won't change. Uh, but uh, this is a good initial start. Depending on your distribution, if your distribution is complicated, maybe you have to increase that. If not, so let's move to the first algorithm that uh, relies on how we can generate uh, Markov chains with certain behavior, which is called. Uh, which generally is a basis for more advanced things that we are also using in the uh, we are using in uh, STAM, we have been using STAM, so the Hamiltonian Monte Carlo. We will be uh, so we'll discuss Metropolis Hastings in a big detail, so you kind of get what's going on. Because this is a very simple algorithm which was uh, put on the list of most important algorithms of. Uh, 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 most important algorithms of uh, uh, to, uh, to 20th century. It was developed by the same group that developed the atomic bomb. Uh, and the Metropolis Hastings algorithm generally relies on the conclusion that, okay, we have a problem that we want to generate samples from certain distribution, which might be very difficult. We might not know it, actually. The problem with not knowing distribution comes from the fact that when we have uh, practical user based theorem, we only have the numerator, likelihood times prior. We do not have the de uh, denominator, the probability of data, as I say, also called evidence, because this value is very difficult to compute. It requires you to average out all possible parameter values, which is impossible in everything but the easiest cases. So, uh, we know the probability distribution are only up to a certain probability, um, a certain probability, uh, certain constant. So the pro uh, proportionality uh, factor. So the idea 
of metropolis Helsinki algorithm is let's generate samples from a distribution that we already know, that we know how to generate those, and then use the uh, uh, and then use the uh, it's, uh, it's possibly uh, uh, verify those values are they coming from our distribution or not? So the idea is that we have some some kind of proposal distribution, usually normal, because it's very easy to generate from uh, normal distributions of, of any kind of dimension, because it reduces to uh, the problem of uh, matrix multiplication. So it's very simple, uh, and. The idea is that we just create our Markov chain by moving from point to point using the uh, normal distribution as a transition proposal. Then, when we approach this new point, we use so-called the uh, acceptance probability, uh, uh, acceptance probability, which is depends on the division between proposal probabilities and the probability uh, distribution values that we want to evaluate. So, generally, in the case of normal distribution, this is symmetric, so this is very simple. Uh, so this factor uh, disappears. But generally, we compare all the uh, probability density function of our distribution of interest in new point and in old point. If we are getting higher probability, then the probability of movement at that point increases. If we are moving to the areas of lower probability, then it decreases. This is the acceptance probability. And then, computing this acceptance probability, we are not putting a threshold greater than something, okay? No, we generate a random number between zero and one. If this number is, uh, is uh, greater than acceptance probability, then, or less, depending on like, the scales. It's, it's not that important. Generally, this random number d decides are we moving or not. So we are not guaranteed to move to a new point. We are not deterministically deciding are we moving to always to points of greater probability. You know, it is more likely to move to points of greater probability, but we still can also move to points of lower probability, or we can decide to stay in the same point. Okay? So that's the idea of uh, Markov chain, uh, of the metropolis facing algorithm, which is generally, as you can see, very simple. Just you need to be able to compute the probability distribution function and then just compare the quotient of uh, its uh, value in the new point and in the old point. And if you use logarithms, it is even easier because you just have to subtract those numbers. No, no, no division is necessary. Uh, and because when we and when we are using the uh, this proposal distribution, as no, this is usually normal, so we get, get something called random walk metro, uh, metropolis algorithm. So it has a random walk that because of this correction factor, this actually the Hastings quotient, it moves to the right points, okay? And this is how the simplified metropolis Hastings algorithm looks like. So generally, the idea is that, that we have some, we parameterize our movement as a, uh, we're using sigma. We, in this case, I'm using covariance matrix of uh, the movement as the uh, diagonal matrix. So each of those uh, movements in all those axes has the same standard deviations uh, and is independent from each other. Uh, we have to provide it with a logarithm of probability density function. Why logarithm? Because we avoid a lot of numerical, potential numerical errors. Remember that when you have, for example, Gaussian distribution start, uh, centered in zero and with one standard division, you get, get x of minus x squared. So if you get x greater than 10, this is effectively zero, right? 
So any computation of that is very, very great potential on the uh, it's a great potential of uh, for the uh, any kind of errors. However, if you logarithm it, then this problem disappears because uh, it just cha uh, changes to minus 100. And this is a number you can easily do computation with, right? Okay, so this is the general idea of, uh, of using logarithms in this case. So here we allocate mem memory, so our for loop won't be terribly slow. Uh, we assigned the random uh, as uh, as a vector as a random uh, normal vectors that will just be uh, with some kind of initial point. I here used non constomitable parameter five, but like generally varying point in the dimensional distribution because we need to provide this queen with the dimension, and we assign initial acceptance as one of the first point because like just just to have something there because we will be storing acceptances for. For, the, for reasons. Uh, so, our initial point is the point we started with. Then we generate the random number, uh, the, the new proposal from the distribution. So, as a very simple, we start with the initial point and use it as a mean of random normal, uh, uh, gener uh, random normal, normal number generator. Uh, normally distributed random number generator with mean of q0 with standard deviation of sigma if q0 is a vector and sigma is a scalar then it's used as a diagonal matrix with and we inform what kind of dimension it is so we get the appropriate values so now we compute the acceptance probability because normal distribution is symmetric, so movement from Q0 to Q1, Q1 is the same probability as movement from Q1 to Q0, so this part disappears because it's the same, so it's 1. So we have only the division of the probab uh, of probability distribution. We perform the, instead of dividing the uh, distribution, we subtract logarithms from each other. So we avoid rounding errors, and then we exponentiate it to return it to the actual values. Clear? That's why that this allows us to uh, avoid a lot of rounding, rounding them, uh, errors, which can be difficult in areas of low probability. This can, can be problems. So uh, we get this acceptance probability, which of course cannot be greater than one. If we started from the point of very small probability and we move to the much larger one, then would, it would get, might get very big numbers. And of course, if acceptance probability is one, then we of course move. Yeah. Uh, we store this acceptance probability for uh, information so we can know if we've transitioned or not and we'll, uh, for further analysis. And now we do this uh, sampling part. So we generate a random number uniformly distributed between 0 and 1, and we check are we greater than the acceptance probability or smaller. If we are greater than the acceptance probability, our new point is stored and we move to this new point. If not, we stay in the same one. Clear? Very simple algorithm, very simple to encode. So let's start with a simple idea, let's get the normal distribution. So it will be simple. We are still not using the data here because from this point of view, it's not really important. Generally, when we provide the data, we provide our distribution, we will have just, it will be more complicated to compute. That's the only difference. From this point, we just need to compute the value of the distribution. So depending on uh, what kind of distribution it will be, there are some issues. So we have normal distribution. We define it logarithm here. This is logarithm of pi, pi so don't be wondering what's going on here. Uh, so generally, we get, if you exponentiate all those things, you will get no standard. Uh, you will get a normal distribution centered around uh, two-dimensional, centered around the point one minus one, with uh, standard deviations if all of the axes the same one. 
Well, we can, of course, plot contour plots of this. So this is the probability distribution on the two-dimensional case. So this is generally a typical radial Gaussian located in zero, uh, uh, located in one minus one, symmetrical in all directions. Simple, right? So uh, we can just use our function for random number generations, and we can see how the Markov chains look like. Because observing Markov chains, so called trace plots is very important because generally if we are looking for something called stationarity that we we can check if our distribution has obtained the all the points uh, is behaving in, in the uh, certain set behaving similarly okay this of course is not like full information but we can see how it's that is moving in certain interval uh, Rather, there is no trend that we can find here because this trend might be difficult if we are uh, happening. It would, uh, it would be suggesting there might be some, some kind of issues. Of course, we can use more chains, and this is generally practiced, for example, using STAN. In STAN, as a default, we use four chains. The number of four came from that for a long, period, a long time. Generally, we have quite, uh, four cores in our PCs. That's why there were four uses, so we can use some kind of uh, uh, improved computation. We, we can have now more, but practically you really rarely need more than four. Uh, there is not a big benefit of like putting it, for example, on thousand par parallel chains, uh, because it doesn't add that much. And uh, so, Move, so those who are excited by using TensorFlow to like parallelize it, it was tried. It didn't. It didn't give much. So it the, the problem of com this computation is not it is not improved by parallelization. The, when one cha when chains are difficult, all of them are difficult, and uh, the parallelization doesn't improve uh, anything. So generally, in this case, we can see in two colors. I think you see those colors. That. Generally, those are similar. We are observing stationarity. This is very, uh, very good. And there are numerical methods of evaluating chains. There are, there are certain diagnostic functions that we can use. When the most significant of them is the so-called R-hat, uh, which is the uh, potential scale reduction factor, which generally is supposed to be a measure of how well the Markov chains are mixing with each other, or in other words, how they are covering the distribution, uh, distribution. The idea is that if we start multiple random chains and those chains are being, uh, if those multiple, uh, multiple chains are being, uh, uh, if there's enough of them, they are covering the distribution, all, all of them are covering the entire distribution. So each individual chain is well exploring the distribution, then they should be similar to each other, right? If we have multiple chains, multiple chains starting from multiple points, all are doing good exploration, and they should, because that's the main idea that each mark of chain with the stationary distribution generated by the uh, Metropolis Hastings algorithm or any kind of other I mean, uh, algorithm like that should cover a typical set well, then uh, those should be similar to each other. And the idea is to compare within chain variance, so how big variance is within all those samples, treating them not as a time series, but just individual samples, so how much they are varying in each other, and how, are, how is the variance between all the uh, all the uh, chains with each other. So taking each, cha uh, each chain, comparing variances of chains between one another, that gives us the comparison of how chain itself corresponds to variance of between the all of chains. Understood? And L hat is computed generally, uh, like that, is defined as such factor that if you can see if the variances are equal, so chain itself and, and between chain variance is, is the same, then it becomes one. So if the, generally we are looking for a hat close to one or equal to one. 
this is the best situation that the uh, that generally that the chains are well mixed. This definition of a hat at the moment can be problematic for certain distributions. That's why new algorithm for determining a hat is the, uh, uh, it was devised. We will be not discussing how it works. It relies on so-called rank statistics, and uh, it handles those problems. But generally, there was it is a relatively fresh development, but it's now implemented in all the relevant software for probabilistic computation. Additional statistic that uh, can be used is so-called Eureka uh, statistics, which relies on the uh, comparison of those estimators that we are interested. So the general the expectations at the beginning and at the end of the Markov chain. So how they are behaving. This is less used, but it is possible there's, there's such such statistic. Generally, uh, we compare uh, the, uh, the estimator from the start and from the end of the distribution. If there are, of course, close to each other, we have zero. Uh, if we there are far away, then might be some indicators of poor mixing. Of course, we started, we, we use samples without the warm-up. So, if we assume that we are covering the uh, the our Markov chain is covering uh, good, so we can split it, take some part from the beginning, some part from the end, and use these for uh, verifying if those estimators behaving, are behaving similarly. Because if we would have some problems with our Markov chain, it would start behaving differently, then this was short. And the idea of uh, such splitting came into the split L hat, which is now the most used one in all the uh, computation, because split L hat works like the, uh, is so called uh, uh, split potential, uh, uh, works like this. We split the chain in half, so we like double the number of chains, but shorter, and we compute L hat for those. And that verifies not only within chain variance, between chain variance, and all, but also the de uh, dependence of start and the end of the chain after warm up. So it can determine certain problems, for example, with too short warm ups or something like that. So we can get more variation in the R hat. And again, if R hat is different than one, we have issues. The exploration is not correct, and that again can be a practical problem which comes from uh, multiple sources. Uh, so for, for our example, we have the, uh, our, using our samples here for one chain, we can just compute uh, split error hat for one chain. We can, as you can see, we get error hat very close to one. And you, as you can see, estimated number of samples is, the, uh, is significantly lower than 100%. Uh, because we had 5,000 samples. If you have, don't you believe me, it's for example somewhere here or here. Number of transition, 5,000 transitions. And we drop the first 100 for the warm up. So as you can see, only a few percent of samples is here. In case of acceptance probability, we really don't have to care about it because it's not being sampled, it's being computed. So, uh, R hat in this case, uh, or effective number sample size, doesn't make much sense. But this was a simple code that I wrote and not something that was especially robust. Uh, and uh, in case of multiple chains, it works practically like this. This is again like, uh, this is, this should be written better, but I have to rewrite a function and I didn't. Uh, had time or especially wasn't that interested in that. Uh, generally, you put all the chains one after another. That's why you, for example, have those 4,000 samples in stand when you use it because all those chains are being just appended one to each other. And uh, you just uh, compute, so for those you compute all those values that you needed and for the error hats you, you just get the uh, you compute a hat individually for uh, you split you know, those chains and so here it's just works like this it's being divided into it's it being stuck together and divide again so it's not a very precise method but generally this will work like this you just get all those samples together and work all those computations this of course when you are using professional software this is being done by you with, uh, not by you but for it's being done for you so the code is there that will cover those stuff. 
Uh, and we can do the same thing that we did last time, so we can see how our estimate behaves. And as you can see, uh, estimate with the error bar of Monte Carlo standard error approaches the expectations that we wanted here. So here we have get some kind of bias, but it's not really something problematic because we are still within one standard deviation from the target. So this was a very simple, uh, uh, simple example, as you can see. Uh, uh, boom, 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 boom. There should be one more thing. Oh no, okay, this is good. So let's see how, uh, how we are covering the distribution, so how the samples behave in the, in, uh, uh, the space of uh, probability space, not as, uh, not as chains. So as you can see, those we are first approaching the, the typical set, the, uh, the distribution, uh, the, uh, our uh, con contour plot, then next 1,000 samples just explodes initially and then it's being fully covered. So this is a simple, good working case that what's, what's happening when we are doing those samples. So as you can see, the typical set is being explored and we get better results. Of course, again, we are working with very simple algorithm that's not very robust or anything. And we are using one or two chains, so again, those, those, uh, uh, this is no, not uh, practical computation. Here we have the kernel density estimate of the, uh, of the distribution, so when you take those samples and use, for example, R plus distribution, uh, we can see those distributions here, okay? Uh, let's move something more complex. So as I mentioned you, the idea of, uh, uh, let's say I have a multi-parameter uh, probability distribution that has two global parameters, uh, mi and tau, which determine uh, other variables. This is a prototype of a hierarchical model. Hierarchical model is something that, let's say we have similar objects that come from, let's say for example, we expect them to be similar to each other, but they are individual. So we have the individual objects Ti, which are distributed normally. So their behavior is a normal distribution, but we do not know the coefficients of those distributions, except that we know the distributions of those coefficients. So we don't know exactly from what distribution they come, but each of them has their own distribution, which is normal, and there is certain similarity between those behaviors. As you can see, we have here put a bit of a hiccup because here what you can see is that we have assigned a normal prior for the logarithm of tau. What does it mean? It means that the logarithm will be distributed as a real number, which is okay, because when we get it from, uh, uh, when the logarithm, logarithm is a real function, but when we exponentiate it, we, we get positive values as with standard deviations. But it will cover all the orders of magnitudes, and practically from 10 to minus 5 to 10 to 5. Because like on one standard deviation, and two standard deviations from 10 to minus 10 to 10 to 10. So we can get very large standard deviations, and we can get very small standard deviations. So we have very big coverage of the distribution, right? Especially that we have these very wide normal distribution, 0, 5, so this is a bit, little bit of spread here. Uh, the first part behaves normally, we can, uh, so it's generally the same like, like previously, we just assign normal distributions to parameters mi and log tau, and to compute, the, to use tau, we just exponentiate the log tau here. And we compute that for parameterized number of n, so which is the number of components, and we get the, the results. If we, uh, let's say, get a bigger distribution, so with multiple components, you can see this probability distribution is a bit, has a bit of difficult representation, right? The, in this case, we are plotting, because this is a multidimensional distribution of, of dimension 12, we have the log tau, and theta 1. So the first coefficient, as you can see, the when theta 1 is close to 0, the probability of uh, log tau is very small, and this, this area is very, very small. So th there's very, very little variance in theta, uh, theta uh, 1 in that case. So it's just, again, like small, vari a small variance, 
So small possibility of movement, right? So this is a complicated distribution in this case, right? So we have some, we will have, some, uh, uh, we will expect to have some issues with that. And as we can see when we sample from it, you can see that we are approaching the probability, but we are not getting insight here. And this is the problem because what's happening here influences our estimators. And this complicated geometry influences our inference. And this complicated geometry is something that happens in practice. Because if your data is skewed, if your data, you can get very difficult inference, you get strange values of parameters, difficult error hats and stuff like that. And all those things come from the geometry. And there are methods of handling that partially by changing parameterization, which we'll cover it later. But generally that's the, uh, that's the idea when we use a KD, as you can see, nothing of that funnel is being captured by that. Those samples, which are located here, just don't capture the complicated geometry. Which again is some kind of problem. As, as you can, and you can see with the me, it's not that bad when we can see that the expectation of uh, the mean parameter is relatively okay because we get the, uh, we can compute it with uh, actual value of me was zero uh, with standard deviation of one because that was our, our distribution that we assigned it. Yeah, and this is, uh, I wouldn't say that this is very, very bad representation of that. We, it's, it's certainly in the uh, same uh, field that is a 0 0.3 and we have standard deviation 0 0.8. So the, this is not terrible. This is not terrible representation, especially for single watch but look what has, was this, the estimate, uh, the effective sample size here for lock up, three. From 5,000 samples, effectively it's like we sampled three times only. That's the issue with geometry. And of course, error is huge, much bigger than one. Q, the, there you won't get like 20, error hat equal to 20, but like you can get it approaching two, for example. Uh, and we can see the estimators, the, again, the me uh, estimator is rather okay, the log tau estimator is not really getting anywhere. It should have zero mean value because it comes from the distribution that is uh, zero uh, uh, zero, uh, normal zero 0.5, but it's anywhere, but not here. As you can see, all the variables here are just terrible, this low, uh, low uh, effective sample size and large hats. So complicated geometry is a problem. And the main issue is that you almost never are able to plot the distribution and see this complicated geometry. We chosen the example that is difficult, and uh, unfortunately, this is not something that uh, is possible in practice, because in practice you have data, you have multiple points of data, so the distribution generally, uh, the joint distribution of data and parameters you have, can, can have a huge, no, a huge uh, dimension. So you cannot plot it, you cannot practically compute it here. Computation of this, uh, uh, this plot here, the entire grid like, took like, over a minute. And this is a very simple example, just to compute the values of those uh, density functions. So getting here is like, in, in practice it's not possible, but we can observe the chains and there are issues that are problematic and that you could, should observe. For, for example, freezing of chains that is, becomes fixed at some point, or very close to fixed, like here or here. This is usually a problem. So when you can see, observe, you observe your distributions, then you can start to looking for certain problems. So when some when statistics are becoming weird, the values are becoming nonsense, especially compared to, for example, uh, uh, predictive uh, posterior predictive distributions becoming weird. Then you can start looking at chains. Is your model bad, or is this model badly sampling? Because the issue is that. Even if your model is okay, it's theoretically okay, and you can still have issues with sampling. 
And diagnosing that is an issue which we will cover also in the, during the next lecture. Um, of course, if we have multiple chains, certain problems can be even more visible. Like for example, here we have some uh, being fixed or something like that. those behaviors that are not really stationary, they are moving. It started sta station. For example, if we only had this chain here and we stopped here, then we wouldn't be observe the problem. So two short chains might be an issue. And multiple chains show us more because if we have multiple chains, then we can verify what's going on. And again, like if we get a multiple chains, we can those even see those problems even larger, those are hats with larger stuff like that. Finally, let's move to the last example. That is also problematic, but, of, but completely from different causes, uh, which is the multimodality. Here we have a very simple model that unfortunately also has practical indication, which is a mixture. Mixture models are statistical basis for clustering and classification. Because you have, your model have to model probability of object behaving to one class or another, so this is a classification, or uh, so you have to have one probability of one, a probability of one second, and some kind of mixing coefficient that you want to estimate. So what is the probability of it coming from one distribution or another? And in clustering, you have a big, bigger problem because you not only estimate those things, but also those. So this is the unsupervised learning situation that you need to get the number, the even if you have the number of clusters, you need to estimate the parameters of clusters. So the, what kind, uh, so determine from the data that they come from different distributions, so there is part in this distribution, part in this, and what kind of this, uh, what kind of distributions are there. So this is a problem. And here it's a very simple uh, mixture of two normal distributions. They are almost identical, you just you can see that they have just the values sw swapped here. So they will have means in different, one in positive points, one in negative points, and then have the uh, uh, inverted uh, standard deviations. Uh, here is a bit more fun when creating the distribution because here we have two normals, which is simple, but then we need to get the um, the distribution, and because we are working on logarithms, the, this sum here, the logarithm of sum is not a sum of logarithms. So that's the problem here, because we need to perform this uh, summing here, so that's the, the, uh, the mixing has to be encoded here, what's happening. So these are the parts of those, and then we are getting the appropriate mix. Uh, mix. And again, we can generate the Distribution. So as you can, that could be expected, we are mixing two normal distributions, right? One here, one here, they look like this, okay? Typical problem, classification, clustering, such things happen. Again, problem is simple because we know it already, we can put, draw a contour plot, it's only two-dimensional, so nothing is terrible, we don't have to infer parameters, it's great. Uh, and of course we can do our computation and look, it looks beautiful, like it looks beautiful, nicer hat, nice effective sample size. We get some values here, but those values, if you remember, those are coefficients of only one of the mixture coefficients. But the chains look also nice. Remember, we know what the distribution is. In practice, we will not necessarily know what it will look like, especially with data, with stuff like that. So complication in the distribution here was designed and it's known, but it can happen without that. We can get the more complicated model here and the issues happen here. We just, our Markov chain very nicely explored only one mode. But, isn't that the Markov chain should explore the entire distribution? Isn't that the whole point that it should explore the entire distribution? Well, yes, but again, uh, it might take some time. So let's take 20,000 
distribu uh, samples, uh, 200,000 samples, so give it enough time. And as you can see, there is a problem. There is no mixing between those modes. You just explore one mode and finally the probability of movement to the second one was big enough, so it jumped away. And it wasn't attracted again to the distribution, but most to the other part of the mixture. So we had only one transition here between those modes. And as you can see, we go here and then boom, we jump here. After 10,000 samples here, we finally dropped here and we are moved here. So we don't have any samples there, we just have them here. And of course, the best idea, the multiple chains are also great help when detecting multimodality. When we plot, make two chains, one gets attracted to one, uh, one to another, then we can clearly see that something is wrong. And when something is wrong, then we can diagnose it where, why it went wrong. So we can see that we have two completely different modes, that, uh, that our Markov chains are converging not to the places that we wanted, and as you can see, they are just covering two modes individually. What to do with that? And this is a problem, again, uh, because this is not a problem that can be solved technically. We are not able to, uh, compute, uh, to solve it by some switching in the Monte Carlo computation. We need to add extra knowledge to our model. We are need to be able to analyze what kind of issues are here. So, for example, when we are having the uh, those multimodels might come from bad prior distributions. For example, in clustering, it is really it doesn't matter if the first cluster is here and the second is here. They are completely exchangeable, right? Unless you provide these priors, that, in this pri that this cluster has to be positive values, this cluster has to be negative values. Then it will remove the multi-mode because it will have coefficient, they will focus on each of those in a separate ways. Especially that, like here, here we have a two-dimensional case. In real cases, we have multiple dimensional cases that will be problematic in multiple ways. Uh, so the main takeaway is here, hopefully, after this lecture, you generally know what, how STAN works, or what, what STAN does. You don't still don't know how it does it, but what it does. It generates Markov chains from our distribution, and having that, we are able to compute the expectations of things that were interesting. So probabilities, histograms, uh, mean values, standard deviations, stuff like that. So all of those can be inferred from this. Okay? However, getting the uh, uh, however getting generally getting the uh, there, how Stan works, we will cover on the next lecture, maybe first half, and we will finish how to compute stuff probabilistically. Okay, are there any questions? Maybe one uh, stuff is allowed to be conducted online? Or is it good no, because I hate doing online lectures. I hate talking to a computer. So can they be conducted like hybrid? They are being recorded, and I will eventually put those lectures, and all those lectures that happened up to this moment were being recorded. This one also. So they will be on YouTube for those that are not able to be present. So that, but I prefer to speak to two, peoples on, uh, two people on the, in the room than to speak to the computer. So if there are only two people who can the lecture, is it a very big problem? No, but if there are less than two, there will be. No one less than two people. Any other questions? Okay, great, thank you very much.